Brilliant. So we usually start these things with a little bit of a hello from people who haven't been before. So we're quite tight on time. So if you haven't been to one of these sessions before, if you just want to like kind of unmute yourself and say, hi, everybody, I'm Steve and I'm working at DWP. It's nice to be here or something like that. Um, so just give you five minutes, maybe a little bit of space for people just to unmute and say, hello, this is my first time. Um, whatever, whatever they fancy, really. Um, please feel free to do that. I'll jump in first. Oh, I got there, got there quick. So ha hello, everyone. This is my first time here. My name is Matt Turner. Um, I'm currently working with um, Stockport Metro Borough Council. Um, but I've worked with uh, a few of you before now and been in training classrooms with you before now. Um, so it was lovely to to get this invitation from Barry to join and I'll I'll be sure to um, share it out with uh, more Stockport and local authority people, if that's OK. Thank Thanks, Matt. Well, I'll jump in next then. I'm Barry Kai. I'm a Senior Agile Delivery Manager based in Newcastle for the Attendance Allowance Team for DWP. Hi, Barry. Hi. I'll go next. Uh, I'm Raj. Uh, this is my first time here and uh, I've joined DWP end of July here and I work in Fed in web team. Hi Raj. Hello. Hi, I'm Sam. Um, I work on the apprenticeship service in the Department for Education. Hi Sam. Hey. Hi, Alex Crosby. Um, I'm a Delivery Manager in Department of Education. Hi, Alex. But he's married to DWP. <laughs> hey, uh, that's that's right, yeah. If I can. Uh, I'm Tom. I'm Interim Head of uh, Product Delivery at the FCDO. Hi, Tom. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Al. I'm not a first time caller to this session. Um, I used to join when I was over at Homes England, but I've recently joined DWP in the DAS team. Um, so, yeah, nice to see everyone today. Thanks. Hi, Al. So, hi, I'm uh, Dave. I'm from North Lincolnshire Council. Uh, I work as a delivery manager. And uh, for my sins, I also head up Agile Delivery in its wider sense. So, nice to be here. Brilliant. Hi, Dave. Hello. Uh, I, don't know I don't know whether I have been to one of these before. I think I have. Can't remember too many meetings. Uh, hello, I'm Phil and I'm alcoholic. Oh, no, that's, that's a different meeting. <laughs> hello, uh, I'm Phil. I'm lead delivery manager um, in the migration and border space for the home office. Brilliant. Hi, Phil. And now I'm going to come on and do a comedy hello. Oh, oh. I'm a bit of a calling ridge. <laughs> um, and I am a head of Agile Skills and the delivery practice at the BBC. And this is, I think, one of the first times from, from the BBC to come to the CrossGov meeting, but I shall be extending the invite to the other delivery managers in the future. So, hello. Hello. Hi, Emma. <laughs> Always That's nice to see a new face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I worked for Emma for a, a number of years. Um, with <laughs> we can say, yeah. So I used to work at DWP with the fantastic delivery team there. Yes, right. Looks like we're kind of drying up a little bit there. So you've got these lightning talks coming up, Jeremy. If you want to get set up, we've given them six to eight minutes. So I'm going to put a timer on for eight minutes. Um, and if we if we run out of time at the end, we'll I'll have chance for some more hellos. But let's just let's just get into it. Jeremy, I can see you you sharing your screen. I'm going to do a little bit of a countdown. Eight minutes starting from. Three, two, one. Now go, Jeremy. And you are on mute. Jeremy, are you there? Good afternoon, everyone. And can you hear me now is the question yep sure, so this is this is all about communication right i ask can you hear me now and maybe do i need to shout a little louder 
for the message to get through. Uh, not sure if you are getting me. Perhaps if I used a different medium, maybe text, maybe phone. Is that what is next? I'm not sure. Uh, sometimes I'm thinking, should it be visual or should it be via a letter? Which is better? I don't know, do you? So, as I said, this is all about communication. Perhaps it's noise on the line. That's why you're not receiving me fine. So if we got rid of that noise, then everything is going to be all right. Right? Maybe not. Actually, it could be something between me and you. Uh, it might be my mood and I'm not transmitting. It might be on your side. You have things on your mind. I don't know. So it becomes a lot more complex sometimes. It's something that we all do trying to communicate, but actually it's a bit more than that. Right. So I ask again, can you hear me now? Right, so how many minutes do I have, Steve? I forgot to start my own counter. I think you've got five minutes left. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, so this was something I, I, I'm, I'm creating for myself, and it's uh, just an aid memoir about communication, because it's something that we all do. We, we, we do all the time, and therefore we may take it for granted that because of our roles, we are uh, expert uh, communicators. But really, out of all the things we do, it's probably the most complicated thing. Yeah, and uh, just from that small snapshot, there are so many things that can go wrong. Sometimes we have a particular style. So you saw it at the beginning, and if you don't hear me at first, then I shout louder. Uh, if you don't hear me at first, maybe then I, I write through your manager or your manager's manager just to try and get things done. And that will be one one scenario. Uh, you may be used to using only one means of communication, uh, the text message or the email, or it could be now the Teams, the Teams message. But, you know, you really you think you may need to vary those those means of communication. Uh, but beyond that, there start being things which are outside your influence, uh, perhaps uh, noise on the line. Uh, anybody who has ever had uh, problems when they're setting up some Teams meetings or Teams communication? Yeah. And then even beyond that, and this is maybe something new that I'm thinking of a lot more is what happens when you communicate? What's my frame of mind? What's your frame of mind? Are you happy? Are you receptive? So uh, I, I, I use this as an aid memoir sometimes when I think the message has not gone through or I've not understood somebody's message. Just look at that and uh, think, you know, can you hear me now? Thank you. Round of applause for Jeremy there. Round of applause. Does anybody have any questions there for Jeremy? We've got a couple, give you a couple of minutes just to ask Jeremy a question or two. Hello? 
Lots of virtual applause going on, Jeremy. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, uh, 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 she, uh, she won. Uh, I'll, I'll go with the last one. Yeah, so it's it's primarily uh, it's something I've, I've done before when I was doing coaching and mentoring. I was just thinking about communication, you know, purely for the discipline of, of it. But now, yes, I, I would use this for self-reflection or a, a simple aid memoir when things are not going the way I expect them to. Gives me something to fall back on and think, you know, which one of those do I need to pinpoint or shall I try a, a different uh, a different style? Uh, and also on the receiving side, because sometimes someone will be transmitting something to me and I think I get it. But then when I assess they're maybe frustrated, then I think again, and it, it gives me a different uh, thought. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah, I, 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 I like what, what, what you're saying much there about the experiment and the tr transmission and reception. This is really with my background of uh, engin engineering. So, you know, we, we used to have one-way transmission, two-way transmission, you know, the Roger and over, you know, all, all that is part of it. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jeremy. I'm going to keep move us on to Neil now. Neil, very quick, very quick on the share there. Uh, he's, he's got a smile on his face. Neil, OK, we've got eight minutes on the clock. Starting from now. Go for it. Okay. So my name is Neil Edmondson. I'm the I'm a head of role in DWP in the digital delivery practice. Uh, and I've come to you, give you a my lightning talk around why do we bother with communities of practice? So first of all, you might ask, what is a community practice? Well, <laughs> if you look around on the internet, look around in textbooks and stuff, there's lots of different definitions of it there. But my, my own take on all of those summarised in a very short sentence is, it's a diverse group of people with a common interest who want to share their experiences and learn from each other. If you, anybody wants to use that, you can put that as a quote on any piece of documentation you like in the future. Um, again, so why, what are the benefits of a community practice? Again, there's lots of stuff around on the internet. Um, people may or may not have heard of Emily Weber. She did a, a, written a book about building successful communities of practice. I uh, also found a good website, communitypractice.ca. Um, they've both got their own definition of what they think the benefits are. The words look very different, but the underlying themes in there are around sharing information, breaking down teams, um, educating people and making people happier and making the workplace um, cultivate uh, um, learning and making sure we're making the organisation and our community better. So next few slides things that you will probably hear people saying, and you may have heard them say them before. So why should we bother? We already do best practice in our team. Well, is there really such a thing as best practice? Uh, we're all striving for excellence all of the time and occasionally you may feel you've achieved it. You may have achieved perfection. Or is that every time everything can be improved? Is everything you do really 100% perfect? And if not, then surely that you, you can learn from it. Maybe someone else does it similar, but different, and you can learn from each other. Perhaps you do do it better than everybody else. So why not share it and share how you do it, and then they can improve. Why should we bother? We're different to everybody else. Diversity, let's start that again. Diversity is good, embrace it. Um, we may be similarities to other. We may look very different from the outside. We may feel very different from the outside. Um, maybe they're just as different as you are, but you can share and learn from the experiences they both got about being different to what you think everybody else is. Maybe you have to do something new that others haven't done. Uh, or maybe other things that other people have done many times before. Or maybe you do something loads and somebody else is wanting to learn. But on the outside, like I said, you may be constructed, you may look differently, but in the inside, we're all donuts. We're not donuts but you get me meaning from the picture. Why should we bother? We meet our team regularly. That's great. 
but are you really learning from each other? Maybe you might hear new things from other people. Maybe others might benefit from hearing you. Um, that little graphic there that's a pretty poor quality, I do apologise, but it comes up with the idea that we've got six different types of meetings. And the four on the left are probably what you're doing or what those people are saying this to you are doing within their teams on a weekly basis, daily basis. But are they really doing the two on the right? They might occasionally do the team building one, but the information sharing and learning from other training and all of those things, are they doing it with those teams? Because that's where the community practice can come. And building new relationships extends those networks to how you help you learn. Networks means access to knowledge and experience. Why should we bother? We don't have time. Always a common argument, probably the one I've heard most. Hence the observant ones of you might notice have changed the quote from a non to a million times. Uh, but consider it, if you had an hour spent in a community session, maybe as simple as suddenly realising you've got direct access to an expert on something in the future. In the future, that might save just a few hours worth of effort, but it might mean potentially days or weeks of delay while you're trying to find that person. Uh, maybe you end up doing it something less effective. If you knew we got direct access to that expert, maybe you could save your time and money um, in way more than the one hour that you've actually spent investing in that time. Equally, if you learn a new skill or a technique in just a one hour event, maybe over the next 12 months, it might make you a bit more efficient, maybe by only that one hour. But that one hour is still a return on your investment. Uh, I think if you can share that with your team easily, that could quickly become 50 hours across your team. Why should we bother? I've done this job forever. What else is there to learn? Um, I would argue in the digital world, staying the same is going backwards. There's nothing really changed since you started. Are we all looking at those ticker tapes and feeding them back through the machine still? Don't think so. But are you really that perfect? If you are, then why not share the benefit of your experience to the rest of the organisation and make everyone else just as perfect? Be part of the community of practice is that word community. We're not by improving ourselves and improving each other, we're improving the whole community. Hmm. Why should we bother? My team is already motivated. Well, first thing I would ask them is, will being a part of a community make them any less motivated? So what harm is it going to do? But shouldn't we be all striving to keep up that motivation? Maybe their motivation and their positivity can elevate teams that are less motivated than yours. Again, that word community, we're trying to motivate and upkeep and extend on that community, on the whole community. These are all the little things that help make somebody's motivation and some of most of the things are the things that they might be doing in their teams on a day to day basis. The benefits of a community is we can add to the development, we can add to that support. And every now and again, you might get an opportunity that you wouldn't have if you're still in your own little silo of a team. But you would see that opportunity across the community. So what are the benefits again? Um, there are short term ones for the individuals, but just as importantly, there are short term ones for the organisation. But the real benefit of a community comes in those long term ones. Um, if we invest in the community and we all work hard in a the community, there are a lot of good ones for the individual, but just to go importantly again, lots of things that the whole team, the whole organisation can benefit from by having that community. And again, it's thinking wider than ourselves. It's about the organisation and the community. And that can stretch as we are doing today, not just your own organisation, but to other organisations where you could come together in that idea of a community practice. If you want to do any further watching, reading, I've mentioned Emily Webber a couple of times. Have a Google for um, building successful communities of practice. She did a quite a good, you um, quite a good event at the Mind the Product in London 2018. It's easily found on YouTube. She has got a book, always worth a read. Uh, and this website, just by looking for this, I found got some really good stuff on there. Um, and the whole idea of community practice. Um, we brought together in the delivery practice to pull together our advertising for our team and our the way that we can run our things. The whole idea of supporting each other. 
connecting sorry. and growing. Finished. Neil. Oh, sorry, tried to interrupt you. You're, you're done. Yeah, questions then for Neil. something in the chat from Matt yeah, and let's have get... a round of applause as well a virtual round of applause for Neil thanks very much is there something in the chat there is there yeah there's a, there's a comment by Matt yeah, I mean we even got a love heart from somebody there did I reaction okay Tony's up next Tony if you want to share your screen Still time if you've if you've got a burning question for Neil, please do feel free to shout out. Tony's ready. Lovely uh, background. <coughs> right. So can Tony. you can you see the screen? Yeah, we so can. How, <coughs> okay, just. This is kind of indicative of, I may go to the cinema far too often, um, <clears throat> but I'm here to talk about, about digital sustainability today. So uh, there was a presentation I did yesterday um, in, um, in London, talking to a, a group of non-executive directors across uh, Deloitte's customer base. And the sorts of things that we can talk about from digital sustainability are quite, quite straightforward. OK, uh, there are some fairly straightforward things that we can do right now. So this presentation was to um, <clears throat> just to warn you that there is a lot of issues around climate change and what our response in DWP looks like. Um, there will be opinions, I will say today, which you may disagree with. Um, uh, and this presentation, as all, most of mine do, contains a soapbox. So bear with me because this means a lot to me. So I will try and put that across to you. I hope you find this interesting. So <clears throat> what we were looking at was when you look at this whole area, there is there's a couple of things to hang on to. One, for those of the, you that remember Judge Dredd, uh, it's the law, OK? There is the UK Climate Change Act. There is the Paris Agreement in 2015. There are amendments in 2019 to the Climate Change Act, where as a country, we committed to it in net zero by 2050. Fine. That's that's so as the uh, Climate Change Commission said, great policy. Now, how are we going to deliver that? <laughs> now, around that on the right hand side, there is uh, things called controls. And these talk about what our suppliers have got to do. This talks about the Treasury Green Book is now saying that projects should start to account for um, <clears throat> projects that emit carbon, and we're going to measure it, and that's another argument, at £250 a tonne. So if you're emitting a huge amount of carbon as a result of what you're about to do, do you want to add that into your project budget? Mm, I, I suspect not, but we that's the starting point. There's a technology code of practice, which I'm sure you've heard me go on about in the past, but it talks about how you design your systems. <clears throat> And the Treasury adds it to its QBR. And one of the initial metrics is what percentage of your projects that meet the criteria, the, the spending criteria, actually have done an impact assessment. And if the answer is quite low, at this point, the CIOs, the Chief Information Officers across government, have committed to supporting this. So the approach that we've adopted within DWP is six strands, really. You've got cloud and the applications and the migration from crown hosting into uh, AWS and Azure. <clears throat> that considers a pace aimed to finish in 2026. All we need to do from our suppliers is make sure that we've got some details. <clears throat> then you're talking about the devices. I was at Google with um, David Dunbar and 10 of his team looking at more sustainable devices. Maybe we don't all need full fat laptops. <clears throat> Then how do we design our services? Do we think about the sustainability? Do we work out what the most efficient software is? That's that's a long term game. Then there's things like this. People, you, what what do you need to know? What, what, what would you like to know? What sort of questions would you ask? You've got estates. Um, <clears throat> little snippet for you. 
uh, estates actually uh, looked at all the all the buildings on DWP's estate and found uh, 38 of them that are at serious risk of flooding. Uh, they didn't tell me which ones, so I can't share that bit. <clears throat> and the other thing is you've got commercials. What do we ask our suppliers? What contract conditions do we put in? And right now I'm starting to take part in some of these reviews where we look at what our suppliers are saying and we try and evaluate whether what they're saying makes any sense. <clears throat> now, handy graphic for those of the, you that like a pint of Guinness uh, is the difference between scope one and scope two, which is the operational emissions and scope three, which is things like staff commuting and, and business travel and so on. That's the black stuff, okay? That's the ratio, about 80-20. So when people start to talk about emissions, that's what they're on about. So we can measure scope one and scope two, and we're now going to start looking at scope three. And that could get very messy because it involves supply chains. Sorry, there's a lot of information here. I hope I'll share the slides afterwards. <clears throat> so in terms of what we're going to do, I, and this is what I'm trying to, to put across here. Sustainable IT is not a risk. It's an opportunity. So it's not a binary choice. It's not... I can have green, but it's going to cost me a lot of money. You can actually find that if you reduce the power usage, then you save money because you won't actually be running those devices quite as hard. And that doesn't matter whether you're at home <clears throat> or whether you are working uh, working in the office. It's all power drawn from the UK power grid. So the sort of things that you've got is IT is embedded in industries. And look at the percentages that we're talking about. If you look at government, almost 55 to 60 percent of the total emissions of scope two and three are driven by IT because we're integral. We're actually the, we're the reason how much of this stuff gets done. And the interesting stuff that, that was published last week was that the government estimated that devices, end user devices, <clears throat> account for nearly 50 percent of the total emissions now. So as we migrate to the data centers, looking good we are getting some benefits from there but we need more detail but for our individual devices what choices do we make do we have one suitable device for each person do we say that you have to have a full fat laptop that runs everything because we insist on running everything locally or could we do it by the cloud could we keep our laptops for six or seven years rather than four years <clears throat> and that's maybe causing a change to the way we work, all right? But the point is, these are easy things to think about in end user devices, data center, how is software designed? I can give you an EPC for a couple of our applications, the equivalent of an EPC. And then there are things like IT services and networks. <clears throat> and of course, to cut down 95% to cut down of the emissions from this call, you just turn your camera off. I'm not suggesting you do that, but that's the sort of thing we're talking about. So here we go. Uh, it, what could we do? It's an opportunity, not a risk. So we optimize the number of devices. We use energy efficient devices. We increase the lifespan. We change the application. So we start to retire stuff. You know how good sometimes we, people talk about DWP. We've got applications that are 35 to 40 years old because they have to, because we need to keep them. We need to start using data centers as elastic computing. We need to start shutting stuff down. All right. So we start to look at the efficiency of those of those uh, particular areas, and we start to use cloud and so on. <clears throat> now, those are selected things we can do. There are also we can start to look at utilities using green power, power purchase agreements, and we could even potentially start building our own green energy supplies if that's what we chose to do. So the last bit I just wanted to cover is that climate change, the debate has changed. It used to be it's not real. OK, now it's real. We're just not convinced it's by humans. And then the red bit is oops. Now for DWP, that will be important because at some point we will have to tackle our emissions. And when we get to that oops bit, that's when you get the action now. <clears throat> and this is the polite version of the timeline. I do have another version, but I wasn't brave enough to use it. OK, so that's me. Eight minutes. 20 seconds. Brilliant. Thanks, Tony. Right. Questions? Yeah. Round of applause. Questions for Tony. 
There is one in the chat. I was just going to say there's one in the chat. Oh, let's have a look. So how does software create emissions, Tony? Well, um, back in the day when I first started working in IT, which is long before most of you, um, used to write in assembler and COBOL. <laughs> and the ind industry estimates show that certain languages like Python, which are absolutely the right language for certain conditions and certain types of processing, actually uses up to 10 times as much processing power to execute a fixed set of instructions. So do we do things like Jackie Legator always bangs on about, right? Is, I'll give you an API, I'll give you some shared code, write once, use many. So every time you run it, the more power that your software requires to run, okay, therefore you have to think about what you're actually trying to achieve with the software. One of the GDS um, directives, for example, is that end user facing applications should be quite light. But one of the things that I was told just the other week was that in DWP, one of the reasons for requiring a powerful laptop is because we're putting everything into the browser and it requires a lot of grunt to run some of our applications. So you've got a choice there, Neil. How do you do it? And the point I'm just saying is, would somebody start thinking about it? Because we haven't done it up to now. Thanks, Tony. Was that okay? So, that was great. Thank you very much. And this, so there's a few questions in the chat. Um, <laughs> maybe if you I seem to, I seem to drag them. those. Uh, Elizabeth, are you <coughs> are you there? Come in, Elizabeth. If you want to share your screen. Is Elizabeth here? Elizabeth Veal, talking about the SRA. Is she not on the call? Maybe let's let's go to John then. Let's say, do, do you want to do John and I'll ping Elizabeth? Yeah, yeah. John Bagshaw, come in, Mr. Bagshaw. I'll be there one second. Let me just work out how we share this. I'm putting eight minutes on the clock for you, sir. So she's thinking about something. Can you see that? I can see that, yeah. Times of Excellent. communication. Yeah. So three, two, one, away you go. Okay, so uh times of communication. Just a little ex thought experiment I've had as I've pondered today. Um, often in my career, um, I've sometimes had someone fairly senior come up and go, what if we add some more resources to the project? And that first thing that you tend to think of is good old Brooks Law, where, you know, we add more manpower. It can potentially make it later, obviously, from Fred Book, um, back from his, his mythical man month, um, where his observation was that under certain conditions, if you add another person, it can actually make a project take more time. So why might that be? Lines of communication. Hopefully it's not an unfamiliar concept. The idea we have a line of communication, which is a path needed for two people to communicate. Each time you add a person to that area you want to communicate in, we need to add another path. And each line that we add adds to that overhead. So, you know, he says, because for some reason it's not showing my notes. Uh, nope, lost my notes. Anyway, so, you know, Quite clearly see three people, three lines, 14 people, 20, 50 odd lines, um, and so on and so on. Which is 14 people is 91 lines. I found my notes again. So say more people, I guess more complicated, which you know certainly feels like it's gonna start backing up our complexity and therefore Brooks Law messed up. Now, here comes the sciencey bit. We can describe that as n squared minus n over two. And if we hit the button, we can just graph it out to show more people we have in our team, more lines of communication. Therefore, things are getting more and more complicated just to try and talk. Again, it's all very, what does that actually mean? Well, as with Scrum, well, I'm certainly a Scrum master. And as we know, Scrum is the perfect in every way. Scrum guide tells us that Scrum team is small enough to retain, nimble and large enough to complete some different work. 
tend to be few people. And in general, those smaller teams communicate better and have and are generally more productive. And indeed, Scrum Guide, which again, we know is perfect in every way for every problem. It gives us this idea of time boxing. So if we take our maximum 10 person Scrum team, we give them this two week sprint and we'll take that usual div division of our event time boxes. We'll get something like, and I won't bother reading it all out, 720 minutes of Scrum events, which as we know, Scrum being perfect is all the communication we need. Now we know for the 10 person Scrum team the same person team has 45 lines of communication. So let's take our 720 minutes, divide it by our 45 lines of communication to give us 16 minutes per line of communication or MP LOC data ish. Now we're onto the spurious bit. So let's expand our original equation. We've got M squared minus N divided by two times by MP LOC which gives us the amount of time per person in our team that we need to communicate. So we can now see that a team of five would need two hours 40. A team of 10 needs 12 hours, as we've already discovered. A team of 25, well, that's when it starts getting a bit interesting. And we'll get to that in a bit. Oh, let's put it in a graph form so we don't have to work out difficult numbers. We've got a nice green bit here, which is the amount of work we can do. Now, as the team size increases, the time we're taking to communicate increases, reasonable enough, and we can now graph that nice and accurately. So we can say that once we've got a team of 25, taking say 80 hours in that two week sprint, 40 hours a week, they're actually gonna spend all their time communicating, which means they're not actually gonna have any time to do the work, at which point we say, well, we're gonna have to have some more time. So we can now answer this question, what if we have more resources? Well, let's take it out, fill it out so we can talk about any team that we increase. So we've got n plus x squared minus n plus x minus n squared minus n divided by two, nice and simple. Or we can even shrink that down. So give us our cost, which is x squared plus x n minus x minus two. You see, and people said quadratic equations wouldn't be useful after you left school to give us this idea. So let's go back to our original idea where we have our idea of a team of 10 and we're going to propose doubling it to 20. So with our team of 10, as we've already established, 720 minutes, about a day and a half for our two week sprint. So if you take our 100 mythical Mondays in a two week sprint of 10 people, take away those 15 days they're going to need to take communicate, that gives us 85 days to actually do some work. Useful enough. But, you know, more people, more work, obviously. So we'll double our team to say 20. Now that's actually going to increase the amount of time we're going to need to communicate by 2,320 minutes or roughly five days. Well, OK, let's go. Team 20 is actually going to be 3,040 minutes, which is over six days. So if we now have our 200 mythical man days, that means we're going to spend roughly 126 of those days communicating leaving us only with 74 days to actually do any work. So by doubling the team size, we're actually going to get less work out because we now have much more communication to do. Science, it's a wonderful thing. So questions. I always put a Star Wars reference into any talk I do. Can anyone spot what that admittedly slightly dodgy reference was? Any thoughts? And puzzled faces, I can certainly see. I'm going to jump Shall in, I? John. I'm trying to take my, put myself on the camera. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, but isn't communicating working? It's a very valid point. But is it actually producing working product at the end of our sprint? I guess is the question. If our goal from our agile principles is to deliver working software on a regular basis, if we've got our team of 25 that is basically spending each sprint talking completely, have they actually produced anything at the end that customer can use? 
And I will also put my hand up that this is a very spurious argument. And, 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 and part of me loves it because actually, I think when you get to the point of 25, and I think that's where you were showing actually, your sprint's full, your, your sprint is full of talking when you get to 25, if you've got two weeks. Uh, the, there's a fair few assumptions there. And, and yeah, I, I, I love the comedy f effect of that. And I also love the point that you're actually making that actually, if you throw more people at stuff, you slow stuff down. And it is all about how we manage that communication. Yeah. Um, and because I, I believe and can talk for far more than 13 minutes about um, the fact that communication is part of the work. That is exactly what we should be encouraging people to do. We shouldn't be. Definitely. I'm a firm believer, face to face, let's get everyone Absolutely. involved. And, you know, great ideas tend to come from all sorts of great places. And the only way you get those great ideas is by making sure we're including everything in the conversations. Being so, smart please, please, I'm, I'm we... not trying to argue that we need to stop people talking. Yeah. Being smart about how we communicate and not having it as, oh, so I've only got 16 minutes to talk to you. There's actually some members of the team who probably don't have 16 minutes to talk to each other. There's not enough content there, but it's being smart about those interactions and how we put those out. Yeah. But I, having disagreed with you, I really like the, the presentation and how you built that up. And quadratic equations, I've got a son doing GCSEs this year, so uh, I'm going to get more <laughs> familiar with those, unfortunately. Let's have and a big come flooding back. Let's have a big round of applause then, virtual round of applause. Okay, so no one with the Star Wars reference? Um, explain that one to us, John. Okay, let's quickly flick back. So Here Comes the Sciencey Bit was from an advert from many, many years ago with the great Jennifer Aniston in Jenna Aniston, famously in Friends. And of course, we famously have the Friends, the one with Princess Leia. Bit thin, but hey, it's definitely a Star Wars reference. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Completely spurious argument, but I think, you know, as, as, as we said, it, it's more just to demonstrate you can't just keep throwing people at a problem. There is a cost to that. So thanks, thanks very John. much. Everyone. So we appear to have lost one of our speakers, unfortunately. So the um, the five talks have now become four. I've put a menti poll in the chat, so if you could, um, before you leave, if you could do that. But we've got 10 minutes now, so we've got some space to use how you want to as a community. I think just a couple of shout outs from me. So next month's um, talk, we've got Laura. Laura Burnett, is Laura on? Um, she's going to talk about discoveries. Laura, are you there? Maybe not. Um, so we've got Laura Burnett. Um, yeah, really experienced. Dis discovery is done when? So, yeah, really practical, really uh, excited about that next month. Um, we'd also like to hear about what you want next. Like this is your community. Um, Barry and I help organise this and try and find uh, content that's engaging. We'd love to hear about what you want to see from this. So if there's sessions, if there's types of things that are more engaging for you, like lightning talks, then please do get in touch with us. You can do that via mail or you can do that via Slack. So across Gov Slack. Um, yeah, so please uh, do volunteer as well if you've got talks. Hopefully this has shown we've got a, quite a nice group here. So um, and it's a safe space to to try out new things as well as um, right, really quite experienced speakers. So, yeah, please do that. There's Gov DMs in the ether as well. If you if it was your first time and you, you may be new to Gov, Gov DMs in the ether is a really nice, interactive, more kind of lean coffee format as well. That's run by uh, by a slightly different group, but that's e equally as uh, useful if, yeah, if not better. So we've got 10 minutes left. Um, I propose that we kind of open the floor and you ask some questions of your speakers and, um, and uh, yeah, and I'll have a discussion. Or if you just want to wave and say, hello, it's um, it's me, Dan. I'm here for the first time ever, whatever. So the space, the floor is yours. They love it when you get silenced, Dave, when you ask a question like that. Yeah, yeah, you had to break it, Neil. Yeah. Questions, thoughts, um, what was good? What should we do? Matt's put something in. Not a question for the speakers, but how do you get an invite to CrossGov Slack? 
um, you ask somebody who's got uh, access to it already. Um, and they can add you in. Um, or you can you can sign yourself up if you have a gov.uk uh, email address. You just need to install the Slack app or you can use it on the web um, and you put in ukgovernmentdigital.slack.com and then you sign up um, on some organisations like DBP. You can't access it from your uh, home machine and you have to uh, forward it to, to another email address to whatever device you're using it on. But there's a lot of chat in the delivery management um, channel on that. Uh, so ukgovernmentdigital.slack.com with your government email address. Yeah. Hi, it's Dave here, Dave Mogatog. Can I ask a follow up question to Tony about docking stations? Are they a bad thing then in terms of emissions but when you're in the office and you're connected your connectivity to a monitor and stuff like that obviously your laptop constantly charging is there any way you can yeah. not have your laptop charging from a docking station yeah. as far as i'm aware i i, my, I myself i just unplug the power lead would that like break your link to the monitor though no not as far as i'm aware i'd have to try it i'd have to try it um using the docking station does does cause an issue. One of the things I do, and maybe this is not official, is I actually have a USB-C adapter, <clears throat> which I take into the office with me, and I plug that in directly rather than use the docking station. Okay, maybe I can't officially recommend that. <laughs> sorry. Um, is this but I, I, of it? Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I was just saying, when you're in the office, you, you connect to a docking station, so you use the monitor and stuff like that. So. Yeah, it's trying to avoid that wastage of when you laptop. But I, I, yeah. I don't use the docking station. All right. All I do is take if you come off the docking when I'm in there and I want to use a screen, and I turn the second one off. By the way, uh, <coughs> I just look for the USB-C connector off the docking station and pop that into my laptop rather than rest the laptop. Uh, and and with the Dells, they don't always fit the docking stations anyway, so I've been forced to find a way around it. Is that something David so. Dunbar's going to look at then? Obviously, yep. we have docking stations yeah. throughout the offices. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Oh, no. I, mean, we, I had Dave Dunbar down at Google yesterday with all of the devices team, and we were looking at the effects of being able to supply uh, cloud devices from Google, potentially. Um, so yeah, we, we are looking at other ways of doing this. Um, and I was chatting to the people who are designing the next stage of the job centers and part of the work that they're doing is saying, well, we won't bother cabling the buildings. We'll just run everything off Wi-Fi. So yeah, there are a lot, there are lots of ways around this. It, I think the, the, the thing to hold on is if we really do, um, 